Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 440, Can a Warship Be Cursed? Hey everyone, Ray here. This episode is a few stories I threw together as I gear up for the Eastern Front. I hope you enjoy them. It's always worth remembering that practice makes perfect. So the main and most important difference between a civilian and a soldier is training, which, yes, costs a lot, but that's how the world works, plain and simple. But as the U.S. was gearing up for the war before and after Pearl Harbor, a few shortcuts were taken, and FDR nearly died because of it. The USS William D. Porter, named after Commodore William D. Porter, was called Willie D., and it was launched in September of 42 and commissioned in July of 43. The crew, and this will come as no surprise, was inexperienced and had a reduced training period due to the needs of the war. About to become one of the numerous Fletcher-class destroyers in the war, she was then tapped for a special assignment. President Roosevelt had agreed to a meeting of the Big Three in Tehran, Iran, and as the Willie D. had just been commissioned, She was tapped to help escort the President, the Chief of Staff, the Secretary of State, and the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ernest J. King, who was brilliant but deadly with his words and his mind. To be sure, the elites of American politics and the armed forces would be on the battleship USS Iowa, but there were to be two carriers and three destroyers alongside, which the Willie D. was one. But the Willie D. showed her potential even before the voyage got underway. As she was backing out of the docks at Norfolk in Virginia, someone forgot to raise the anchor. Soon, the heavy metal apparatus was caught on the railing of another destroyer. The railings, some of the life rafts, a few small boats, and other equipment were pulled off of the victim destroyer, and it all fell into the water. Captain Wilfred Walter of the Willie D. apologized and started out to meet up with the USS Iowa. It's probably best the president wasn't there, but old Willie would get another chance to impress. Eventually, all the ships of this most important convoy assembled, and radio silence was ordered. No sense in telling the U-boats where they were. But never fear, the Willie D is in the house. While sailing along, keeping as quiet as possible, an improperly secured depth charge dropped and rolled off the ship, and then exploded. The other ships immediately went into evasive maneuvers, as clearly they were under attack. Which forced Captain Walter to say, Sorry, that was me, again. To which Admiral King gave a look that probably took 20 years off the captain's life, not to mention what it may have done to his testicular region. Things settled down, and just as the fleet was east of Bermuda, the president a naval enthusiast, which is putting it mildly, wanted to see some action. What does it look like when a warship is defending itself from an air attack? As the saying goes, a whisper from the president is louder than a scream from anyone else. So weather balloons were launched to give the gunners something to shoot at. Soon the guns on the Aya were blazing away, and FDR was impressed. But not all the balloons were hit, and a few drifted towards the Willie D. Here was Captain Walter's chance to make amends. So he ordered his gunners to let loose. But then he decided to add on to this dazzling display. He also ordered a practice torpedo run. But even a practice torpedo run needs a target. And the Iowa was just right there in front of them. Well, why not? Calculations were made, the process was followed, and the mock firing of two torpedoes went well. Again, repetition is important. Then there was the third torpedo. A crew member below, probably some kid, forgot to take out the priming pin, which initiates the combustion process. So the officers on the bridge heard the unmistakable sound of a torpedo launching. And this torpedo was heading right for the Iowa. Again, it was the target. But on board that target was the top brass of the U.S. guiding the war effort. Remembering the radio silence, Walter ordered his crew to signal the Iowa with flashing lights. 
but the young crew member was slightly freaking out, knowing that they were about to kill the president, so garbled his many attempts at sending a warning. Not wanting to end up in the history books for this, Captain Walter broke radio silence. It was preferable to breaking a battleship and told the Iowa to turn right now. There were a few more seconds of confusion and thus delay, but soon the Iowa began to turn. But she didn't just turn, she was trying to defy physics. And as FDR was on the deck in his wheelchair, it started to follow the laws of centrifugal force, which would end up with the wheelchair and its occupant flying overboard. Fortunately, men were around the chief executive, and thus the wheelchair was held in place. The torpedo missed the Iowa by a few thousand yards, which was a close thing in these conditions. But at least the president got to see it detonate, and he did want to see a show, right? Mission accomplished. Forget the German subs. Clearly someone on the Willie D wanted to kill the president. So the Iowa kept turning until her rather large guns, dozens of them, were pointing at Walter and the Willie D. Oh, the Iowa's nickname was the Big Stick, and she was about to show why. Walter explained what happened as fast as he could, and at the end of his short speech, Admiral King asked the Willie D to leave the convoy, in that colorful, forceful way that sailors are known for, and to head for Bermuda. The sailor who failed to remove the pin was punished, but that sentence would end up being reduced because it was confirmed to be just simply a horrible mistake. It was a kid still learning the job. Honestly, it became just another story that FDR would tell people when he was making them very bad drinks. As for the Willie D, she would never live this down. For the rest of her career, whenever she entered a harbor or came upon another ship, someone on that end would get on the radio and yell, Don't shoot! I'm a Republican! Which means this next part was probably for the best. The destroyer was soon sent out to the Pacific to help against the Japanese. But on the morning of June 10, 1945, with the war just two months away from being over, a kamikaze pilot dove down at the Willie D. But perhaps taking on some of her bad juju, the plane missed. But as things ended up, the Willie D soon sailed over the plane, which is when her bombs went off. The ship was lifted out of the water and then slammed back down. Never a good thing. The crew went into salvage mode, but the damage was too extensive. So, in a way, the kamikaze pilot scored. The Willie D would go down near Okinawa. Fortunately, none of her crew were killed. Life would go on without the Willie D. And her crew, like the president, had a really cool story now. You know, about the time they almost decapitated the U.S. government and military right in the middle of World War II. Hey everyone, Ray here. Summer is over and fall has arrived. And with that, a season full of activities. Your time will be even more limited. So let Factor help you. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, has got what you need for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. With chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered right to your door. You'll save time, eat well, stay on track, eating healthy, while everyone else notices their pants getting just a little tight. Skip the trip to the grocery store and all that prep, which you would have to clean up anyways. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. Factor has 35-plus flavor-packed meals to choose from. And when I say flavors, I mean fall flavors, like the limited-time-only meals with seasonal veggies, like cranberry pecan chicken and apple Dijon pork chops, or level up with their Gourmet Plus options. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. And don't forget their lunch options, grain bowls and salad toppers, no microwave required. And they have Protein Plus meals as well. My children like Factor's breakfast options. I like the short amount of time needed to prepare them, like apple cinnamon pancakes, bacon and cheddar egg bites, and other choices. Eat well without the hassle. Head to factormeals.com slash worldwar250 and use code worldwar250 to get 50% off. 
That's code World War 250 at factormeals.com slash World War 250 to get 50% off. The Massacre at Bamber Bridge With the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. was officially in the war. The planning between the U.S. and the U.K. got underway, yet each side had different priorities. But in time, it was decided that one, Germany would be defeated before Japan, and two, U.S. troops, all kinds, would be sent to the island nation, with an eventual eye to a cross-channel invasion. The British were ever so happy and relieved to finally be getting some help. But what they did not realize in their moment of need was America was bringing its bad along with its good. As the troop buildup got underway, certainly the American planes and pilots that would help bomb enemy territory, logistics units were also sent over, one being the 1,511th Quartermaster Truck Regiment, a logistics unit made up mostly of black Americans. At the time, the U.S. armed forces were segregated, and they would stay that way until President Truman's 1948 executive order. Anyway, the 1,511th Regiment's job was to take supplies to other U.S. regiments across the country as they practiced and prepared for D-Day the following year, 1944. They were based in a village called Bamber Bridge, Lincolnshire, where the U.S. Army Air Base 569 was placed. But also in the area, on the north side of the village, was the 234th U.S. Military Police Unit, made up of mostly whites. And indeed, the black and white regiments had already had a few run-ins. Now, the British people, again relieved that help was here, were welcoming to the black soldiers. So they were a bit put off when they found the two American groups stayed away from each other. But this came from attitudes that had been around since the end of the U.S. Civil War. After that war, the South imposed Jim Crow laws that led to segregation, i.e. separate but equal, as a legal basis. These laws were in some form in 23 states, mostly in the South, and said that there would be segregation in regards to where a person could eat, shop, live, walk, sit in public transports, go to school, and of course, work. But some states took it even further. Georgia had a law that said a black man could not be helped by white nurses. Alabama said black barbers could not cut a white person's hair. Back to the trucking regiment, it will come as no surprise that their officers were white. But usually these officers had proven less effective at leadership or decision making. And this was what the army did with them. This was their punishment. As for the black Americans back home, now helping the country gear up for war, they had it no better. As the army needed vehicles of all kinds and guns, factories in the South needed labor, so many people from the South started heading north. Again, the living quarters were kept separate, but all the work got done. Occasionally, a black worker would be recognized for doing a good job, or even worse, promoted, which is when the white workers would halt production in protest. This was certainly common in Detroit, and on June 20th, 1943, a large group of blacks faced off against a large group of whites. Both sides broke the law and beat up people from the other side when caught unawares. Destruction in some sections was complete, and the fighting went on for three days, and would have continued had not 6,000 army soldiers with tanks shown up. In the end, nine whites and 25 blacks were killed. When the U.S. troops of all colors started heading out to the U.K. in 1942, they were given a pamphlet as the vast majority had never traveled before. This was to get them ready for life in the British Isles. It stated that the British were not snobs, just reserved. They liked sports, as in they really liked sports. They called their theaters cinemas, but the Brits were never so happy as when they were in a pub. Soon, the Americans were practically British in this regard with their newly discovered love of pubs. But after the race riots in Detroit, the military police in Bamber Bridge called for a color band, hoping to head off another uprising. Now, to blame one side in a battle that both keenly wanted is a bit much. 
But they were the police, so this went into effect. Until it didn't. There were three pubs in Bamber Bridge, and when they heard the order by the military police, they put up the required sign in their window. However, these signs read, Black Troops Only. Clearly, the black troops on this side of the Atlantic had the support of the locals. After all, the Americans were here to keep the enemy away. Probably finding it ironic and amusing, the black troops on June 24, 1943, went to the Ye Old Hob Inn on Church Road. And as all good things come to an end, soon it was last call. The British call it last orders. But some of the troops did not want to stop and placed an order after hours. Two passing MPs were flagged down. Private Eugene Nunn, a black soldier, was spotted by the MPs. It's not clear if he had been the one trying to get a drink after last call, but they decided to place him under arrest for a minor uniform offense. Soon, it was the MPs on one side of the room and the black troops on the other, being backed by the locals. Then it got worse, with tempers rising, mixed with alcohol. Private Lynn M. Adams threatened an MP with a bottle. Another MP, Roy Windsor, drew his gun. Fortunately, a staff sergeant stepped in between the two sides and calmed them down enough for the MPs to leave. But Adams, still holding the bottle, threw it at the jeep as the MPs departed. The two MPs were incensed and so gathered up two more of their unit and went looking for the soldiers. They found them at Station Road, walking back to the base. Soon they were come upon, and the accusations and counter-accusations started up again. But this time, there was no staff sergeant to break things up. A scuffle began. Private Nunn punched one of the MPs. One of the four MPs fired his gun, which struck Adams in the neck. And much like what had happened at Detroit, the blacks were convinced that they were about to be attacked, so gathered their weapons. This was hardly over. Around midnight, with more MPs now packed into several jeeps, and they were being followed by an armored car with a machine gun. Again, the details are murky, but British officers claimed that the MPs ambushed the soldiers and started a firefight. The locals stayed inside while bullets were exchanged, and the shooting went on until 4 a.m. Seven men were wounded, but Private William Crossland of the Trucking Regiment was killed. 32 soldiers were found guilty of a slew of crimes at a court-martial in October of 43. But the sentences were reduced, as it was obvious that racism had played a large role. Then stepped in General Ira Erker of the 8th Air Force. He ordered that all the black trucking units were to be formed into a single command, and all of their racist white officers were to be removed. Further, the MP patrols were racially integrated. There would be a few more incidents before the war was over, like in Australia, but the shooting at Bamber Bridge put everyone on notice. A turning point, if you will. And yet, after the war, most of the black soldiers, when they went home, they would have to face another 20 years of Jim Crow laws. Hey everyone, Ray here. If you're like me, you've wanted to buy gold for years. Lots of commercials out there, but who can you really trust? I didn't want a bad investment, but didn't want to miss the boat either. Sound familiar? Fortunately, I've got great news. If you have an IRA or 401k and want to buy physical gold, eliminate fear and uncertainty from the process using the new gold IRA company integrity checklist. It helps you evaluate and choose the best gold IRA company. I used it personally to vet Augusta Precious Metals, and they are absolutely phenomenal. Use this checklist to choose the best gold IRA company. To get your free gold IRA company integrity checklist today, text GOLD to 68592. Again, text G-O-L-D to 68592. That's GOLD to 68592. Or go to Augusta Precious Metals. Dot com. Next is, this is why we can't have nice things. There once was a young man named Jeffrey de Havilland. He was a speed junkie. We all know the type. To experience near death 
is to taste life. He wanted to be a car engineer, but then planes came along. He was born in 1882 in the UK, so at the turn of the century, when planes came on the scene, he was raring to go. Anyways, he now wants to build and fly planes, but needs cash. So he goes to his maternal grandparent, gets 1,000 pounds, and starts his own airplane manufacturing company, named, wait for it, de Havilland. He builds his first plane. It does well until it has a rather nasty meeting with the ground. But the young de Havilland says, that was fun. Let's do it again. So he's building planes, but he wants to use wood instead of metal for a variety of reasons. It's cheaper and lighter, thus it can go faster, and that's what he wants. But then international events intrude. In 1934, London wants a new plane for the next war. Yes, tensions are already rising. In fact, China had been invaded two years ago in 1932. So the British flying clubs put on a race. Everyone has to build a plane and see who can fly it first to reach Australia. And de Havilland's comet, that's what he called it, won the race. It's now 1936, and Nazi Germany is openly rearming. Now London needs to catch up. De Havilland enters the competition that the government has, but he will stand out from the rest. They are building big, heavy metal planes that are full of guns to fight off the fighters. But Jeffrey decides a plane made of wood with no guns would be much lighter and thus faster. The fighters won't be able to keep up. His plane, when done, will have two Merlin engines and has a cruising speed of 325 miles an hour and a max speed of 400 miles per hour. And it could be built faster than the metal planes and the woodworkers involved are not yet actively helping in the rearmament program. It's a win-win until it isn't. Remember, money makes the world go around, and all the builders, politicians, and other hangers-on want their kickbacks. You know, where's the graft? But there isn't any, or there's a lot less here. So in time, de Havilland's plane, clearly superior, gets shut down. And the man who gave it its killing blow was Minister of Aircraft Production, Lord Beaverbrook. But there was one man who was impressed by de Havilland's project. RAF officer, pilots, and the man chosen to pick the plane for the RAF, Wilfred Freeman. As a pilot, it checked off many of his boxes. But again, politics got involved and it died. Side note, Freeman also chose the Spitfire, the Hurricane, and the Lancaster. So he knew what he was talking about. But Freeman himself was sacrificed on the altar of money. He was fired and reassigned. But then war comes, and everyone in the UK suddenly has the right priorities. Almost. The Battle of Britain is well underway, and the British are losing pilots and planes fast. New pilots, though, have to be trained, and planes have to be built. But metal is scarce and expensive. If only there was another way. Remembering the wooden wonder, if I may, de Havilland is told to build 50 of them and the pilots come to love these planes during test flights. So they've got a plane, but it has nothing to do. Then, remembering its range, again without all that weight, it is designated as a surveillance plane and told to scout towards Norway. It does with fuel to spare. This plane, called the Mosquito, spends 1941 doing reconnaissance work, but it can also hold... 4,000 pounds, so it's time to put some bombs in her. Which brings us to Operation Jericho. The Germans by now control Norway, and the British want to strike at Gestapo headquarters there. This is 1942. The Mosquitoes make the bomb run and get in undetected, but there's a problem. Because it's made of wood, the pilots want to make sure they live, you know, after the bombs explode, and they'll be flying in low. So they put 11 second delay on the fuse. Problem is, the bombs, when they hit the headquarters building, go in, go through, and come out, and then explode. Which means the building was not brought down as it was supposed to be, but it did have three massive holes going through it, mostly sideways. Not bad. 
Now that it's passed this test, it will be used to bomb Germany at night. Again, it can hold 4,000 pounds of explosives, and so for the next 220 nights straight, the mosquitoes visit Germany, which ends up being called the Berlin Express. Someone finally asks, why aren't we suffering terrible pilot losses like all the other planes? Oh, it's made of wood. German radar has little to work with. Well, if that's the case, why not bomb during the day? Yes, it's more dangerous, but to get in undetected and then bomb and hightail it out of there, that's worth trying. And then comes the reason I chose this story. It's nearing January 30th, 1943, the 10th anniversary of Hitler coming to power. There will be a great speech by ace pilot himself, Hermann Goering. Further, it will be broadcasted throughout Germany. No, the war is not going great, but it's at its tipping point, so anything is possible. It's 11 a.m. German time, and Gehring is about to start. Suddenly, a droning sound is heard by the radio listeners. Then they hear explosions, and then the radio goes silent. The mosquitoes have bombed the radio towers that were to broadcast the speech. Later that day, Goering would make his speech, but there were no applause. No one interrupted him with cheers. They probably wanted to get the heck out of there. And it did not help that Goering told the 80 million Germans that every single one of them had to be ready to sacrifice themselves, literally, if and when Hitler gave the order. Also, this was the first daylight bombing run on Berlin, so not good for German morale. Nazi Germany, believe it or not, was pissed. You would be too, and so Goering orders more night bombings against the UK. To combat this, the Mosquito is transformed into a night fighter. It has eight guns. The Germans have radar in their planes, as do the British, but the Mosquitoes can't be picked up, but the German planes can. It becomes a bloodbath in the skies. And now that the DH-98 de Havilland Mosquito has more than proven itself, the British really put on their thinking caps. Someone says, instead of just bombing at night, let's already have mosquitoes over German airfields at night, and then we'll send in the metal regular bombers. The Germans will react, they'll try to send up their fighters, but we will shoot them down with the mosquitoes just as they take off. They'll be sitting ducks ducks and mosquitoes all over the place. And this is exactly what happens. For a German to fly at night towards the UK is tantamount to a death sentence. Goering is frantic, so decides to fight fire with fire. He wants his own wooden plane. But remember the politics and, how should I say, lack of financial incentive to build the first mosquito? Well, Goering runs into the same thing. He is told no. Oh, eventually, there will be a test of a wooden plane, but by then, it's early 1944, and the war is on a path that cannot be altered. Which just goes to prove, once again, that politicians and politics are a necessary evil and should only be brought out every once in a while, you know, like a groundhog. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So you're probably going to hear my dog in the background. Sorry about that, Finn. Uh, He's got a lot to say. So anyways, I would like to uh, say hi to some new members. Bruce Caldwell from Signal Mountain, Tennessee. Thank you, Bruce. Angela Neuschwander from High Ridge, Missouri. Karen Reinlib from Durham, North Carolina. Thank you, Karen. And James Powell from Brentwood, Tennessee. Um, so those are all the new members supporting me. Thank you very much. It is so appreciated. Um, and then I've gotten several great emails over the last week or so, so I thought I'd share a little bit of that. Let's see here. I got a very nice email from a Lee Matthews, who, like me, can't wait to go on some World War II tours. There's just this little thing called, um, oh, money. Yeah, so we both have to wait for that. Then I got a lovely email from a Don Lawrence, who is currently in St. Croix, St. Croix, but I think he's, 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 I can't remember where he's from, Concord, something. Anyways, so he gave me some great technical advice. Don, thank you very much. He also donated and he became a member. So Don, I want you to know that if I ever have another child with my wife or anybody else's wife, it doesn't matter, 
I'm going to call him Don in your honor. Thank you. Uh, then there is Andy Creeper. Uh, he liked that I mentioned the Channel Island Sark. His grandfather was a medical sergeant on the Channel Islands during the war. So Andy, thank you very much for listening. And then Jim Snyder is sending me two books on the 8th Air Force, and I promised him I would find them a good home, probably in a university library, when I'm done devouring them. So Jim, thank you very much. So I'm still doing research and I'm still um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to pick up where I left off, but I have to do like a recap to get everything caught up. So it's taking a while. We're almost there, but I just wanted to put this out so you didn't have to wait. And and I enjoyed these stories and I've got other ones. I, I might do them at the end of a regular episode. But anyway, so um, I hope this holds you over until I can um, uh, get going again. And maybe this weekend, for those of you in the Gettysburg, Pennsylvania area, a uh, friend and I. Jesse are trying to uh, plan a trip to Gettysburg and the World War II Museum that's in Gettysburg, which I did not know about until recently. So I'll let you know more about that. But um, if you're in the area and things sync up, come by and say hi. Um, It'd be cool. Anyway, so thank you very much. And as always, take care, everyone. Can I get a whoop whoop? I'm Lacey Green, and I'm a super trainer at Body. That's B-O-D-I dot com. And you know what's missing from the entire fitness industry? A program for beginners only. Not anymore. I've created a program called For Beginners Only, and it is for everybody and everybody. It's a three-week program only on Body, the world's first health esteem platform. That means it's a place for you to work on loving who you are right now as you work on who you are becoming. I'll ease you into exercise with low-impact cardio, strength, core, and mobility workouts that will help you feel great as soon as you get started. I'll help you build your foundation and show you how simple it can be to make a change just by showing up. It's for beginners only because I want you to know you can do it, and I want you to get results. Let's find the joy and drop the judgment. And woo woo! Now get $89 in free bonus gifts when you sign up at body.com. Just what you need to start your fitness journey. For details, go to body.com. That's body with an I.com.